Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, thank you for, to the organizers for uh, having me uh, here today. Uh, I will talk about miniature camera modules and uh, uh, visualization in uh, microinvasive uh, surgeries. So, uh, Weber is uh, part of the AMS group, and uh, actually as of uh, January, we will not use the Weber brand anymore, but AMS, so I start a presentation with a few corporate uh, slides about AMS, which may be less known in the imaging uh, community, but uh, AMS as a sensor provider has actually uh, a number of medical applications, um, that would be the field uh, we are in, and actually quite a lot of imaging uh, activities. Uh, we do have X-ray imaging, especially dental, intraoral and extraoral, so, so panoramic scanners, uh, X-ray imaging for, for CT scanners, uh, for PET detectors, the, the time to digital converters, and uh, also some activities in ultrasound imaging, and uh, since uh, Weber is part of AMS, uh, also for the endoscopy application. So that's what my talk will mainly uh, be about from the other areas uh, that would be with some colleagues of mine and have strictly no idea. <laughs> so uh, coming to medical endoscopy, I think uh, uh, my previous speaker prepared me the floor very nicely uh, with, uh, with many nice, uh, nice images. Um, so, uh, medical procedures and, and uh, diagnostics uh, is preferably done nowadays without open surgery. I mean, we try not to be uh, like in the times of uh, Dr. Hunter that we visited yesterday where you had to actually cut the body open to find out how it worked uh, inside. But it's much less traumatic for the patient if you can use uh, natural orifices, natural inways um, to, the, to the body. Uh, but that requires that our visualization tools, they're a bit smaller than the DSLR camera uh, that we take, so you need to have vision modules that are small. Uh, not only for diagnosis, but also for other tools, for, for procedures, it generally helps to see what you do. Um, so that uh, can also um, allow to add vision uh, to other tools if we get the modules small enough and low cost enough that they could go to other devices. So if we talk about medical endoscopy, uh, uh, as an image sensor manufacturer, you immediately think medical endoscopy, yeah, we need to put the camera somewhere there. Uh, now, the bad news, uh, let's say for a sensor manufacturer or an or a, a IC uh, company is that medical endoscopy is an extremely segmented uh, field. Um, so you have to learn a lot of uh, Latin or Greek terms uh, <laughs> to get your way around. And many of those uh, endoscopic procedures, wherever you would go, they have somehow specific uh, requirements in terms of size, in terms of resolution, in terms of what you would want to look at, how you have to articulate um, the scope. But it's, it is a quite wide field and, and uh, there is, it's, it's a very innovative field where, where you have many um, uh, contributors that, uh, that help to make uh, these tools um, ever uh, more performant, ever better to use, ever less traumatic uh, to the customer and, and uh, positively influencing the clinical outcome. Generally, some requirements remain that come to the sensor uh, for all of these applications. Uh, the instrument should be smaller, the resolution should be better, and uh, the whole thing should be cheaper. Uh, so, what can we do as a sensor um, design company to contribute to, to this? So, interesting for us is uh, especially the chip on the tip endoscopes, um, where you would bring the camera module actually to the tip of the uh, endoscope as opposed to endoscopes where you have optics, uh, road lenses or fiber bundles to bring the image out of the body and put it on a larger size camera there. So that, that's basically what we focus on and 
in this area as, as a way uh, we decided to really concentrate on the endoscopes with three millimeter or less diameter. Uh, that's where we found out that we could put most benefit um, to the uh, solution. Especially in small diameter flexible endoscopes, uh, nowadays we, we have a clear uh, shift from fiber bundle scopes to um, chip on the tip endoscopes, uh, mainly driven by the enhanced image quality. You can see here two images side by side from a fiber bundle endoscope and from a chip on the tip endoscope. Uh, I think it does not take a lot of words to uh, describe on which image you can see more, where you can make a better diagnosis and ultimately a safer surgery. So if we look at an endoscope system, it basically has um, three parts. Uh, one part of the endoscope system is the so-called tower, that's where the display resides. And then you actually have the, the endoscope where, where you have a handpiece uh, and uh, you have the tip. Uh, so this is also called distal. That's basically what you stick into the body to see something. Um, so when we want to make a miniature camera system, uh, obviously at the tip, that's where the size has to be small. Uh, so we do need to make the image sensors and the camera module as small as possible. One thing to get things small is you skip everything that you can. So you try to move functionality to the handpiece or to the tower, to the proximal part where you have more space. And in case of disposable parts, when you, when you throw actually uh, the endoscope away after the surgery also, that helps to reduce cost because the things that you don't do, uh, you don't have to pay for it basically when you throw it away. It's, it's as easy as that. Uh, so how can you get the camera small? Uh, well, the first thing is you try to have a small chip, obviously. Uh, but with a small chip, we have a small resolution or at least the size uh, that we take advantage for making imaging, that's where we have actually the pixels. And the critical thing is to get that periphery uh, reduced. So when we started to embark on, on small camera sizes, we really had to look at the, at the circuit uh, architectures to get this uh, periphery down as much as possible. Um, nowadays, uh, with, the, with the pixel level or column level stacking technologies, uh, there may be more options to get uh, the pixel matrix really out to, to the periphery, but only the first thing that helps is just skip things. Then if you think at the classical packaging, as it was used uh, probably in the first 30 years of, uh, of integrated circuit design with a ceramic substrate and some wire bonds, if you want to make that less than three millimeter size, you basically don't have any area left for the for the chip anymore. Uh, so it's, it's getting mandatory to, to use chip scale package technologies. So typically TSV uh, kind of package technologies. It's pretty much like a PCB. You make a hole uh, through the silicon. Uh, you put copper in it that connects to the front side and you can have your solder balls or, or your contacts right on the back side. So you don't have any area overhead besides the active circuitry that you really need to operate your chip. The same holds true for the lenses. So uh, classical lenses, you have the lens, that's, that's what you need to, to get your image, but usually also have a barrel to hold the lenses in place and, and fix them somehow to the sensor that will actually add uh, size to the module. So that's why we came up with the wafer lever uh, lens solution where the lens kind of uh, with a flat glass surface sits right on top of the uh, image sensor and you don't need actually a lens panel anymore. <clears throat> now the last challenge and, and maybe one of the most difficult ones even though it's, it sounds pretty trivial is uh, usually a camera module you need somehow to get the signal out so you need some wiring solution and the smaller you get uh, when you get lower than one millimeter uh, you try to have few uh, contacts, uh, the maybe three, four contacts you will always need. You need power and you need signal. Uh, so you get to a quite, quite fine pitch and 
attaching in a cost efficient way fine cable to, to fine components turned out to be quite a challenge. Uh, but you can make these small moly, uh, modules in the end. So the good news about the semiconductor industry is that uh, there is a huge technology drive there, mainly paid for by all of us having a high-end camera in the pocket all the time and buying a new one every two years. Uh, so the mobile phone industry came up with a lot of great assembly, packaging, production technologies, and especially uh, since we do have uh, selfies and, and uh, put our whole life on Instagram. We do have really great cameras and, and great uh, pixel technologies there. Well, when we started with CMOS images in the 90s, uh, the big claim was we use standard process technology as opposed to the CCDs. In the meantime, I think CMOS image sensors, they have integrated all the uh, all the nice features of the CCD area with body devices, charge transfer structures, uh, uh, special doping layers to have a low dark current and all of these nice technologies that were mainly developed for the, for the mobile phone industry, we can actually make use of it for the medical endoscopic uh, devices and they come at a fairly reasonable cost. So how do uh, these technologies look like? A little bit more in detail. Uh, we very conceptually look at wafer level lenses. So uh, as opposed to making classical lenses where you take a piece of glass and, and you turn it down to have a, your round shape, uh, we start with a glass wafer that has the same size as our CMOS wafer, 8 inch or 12 inch wafer. And you make your master, which holds when you have small lenses, it can hold a few 10,000 uh, lens sides on, on, on one master. You replicate a thermoformal polymer and then you press the whole thing together and when you separate it you basically have your lenses on the glass wafer and that's how it looks like and you made your 10,000 lenses. Now the next step is to assemble 10,000 lenses to 10,000 sensors. That's quite a job if you do it one-to-one -one. but if we have it on the wafer you take your CMOS wafer, um, here a slightly larger sensor from us uh, for the nice picture. <laughs> but you basically do a, t uh, to a chip scale package, which is nowadays standard in, in, uh, in the imaging community. So you have a full wafer where you already have the solder balls on the backside. You take the lens wafer, you glue the two things together, uh, try to align it pretty well, and and then you take a pizza slicer and you cut up your 10,000 cameras and there they are and the lens has conceptually exactly the same size as the image sensor so you, you do not add any space um, for, the, for the lens model. So this pizza slicer is a little bit of a challenge if you have a combined stack with polymer, glass and uh, silicon. Uh, so uh, it was not straightforward to, to just dice it without uh, destroying all the lenses. But with some process tuning, it's, it's quite feasible to do it, even though the aspect ratio of the stacks that we dice uh, is sometimes more than two to one. Uh, so you don't have a lot of surface to hold uh, the cube on, on the foil when, when, you, when you dice through it, which is a quite crude process. Um, so there is quite some technology development there, but in the meantime, I think reasonably well managed. So that's yeah what we started with in 2006, and since then I'm kind of doomed to it, or I became the Mr. Nanai camera. Uh, we were quite early with using wafer level assembly uh, camera modules uh, because we did not do it necessarily for the cost, which is the big driver in the mobile phone world, but really for the endoscopic world, it was an enabler to get the module size down and we can pay for things like combining yield. So if you make a wafer level lens, you do not have 100% of the lenses that are good in shape and you never have 100% of your chips that are uh, working fine. So if you start to stack things wafer to wafer, uh, the good things is always a multiplication of it. 
Uh, if you have very small chips, the yield is somewhere north of 99%. Uh, so you don't lose too much there with the, with the 0 0.5 millimeter chip on the defect density, especially with nowadays technologies. Uh, while if you have uh, a 10 uh, or 20 square millimeter chip, the, the yield uh, starts to get significant. And, and if you have a complicated lens, the yield is also significant. So as opposed to mobile phone uh, industry, the, the full wafer level approach works out for, for small size uh, sensors pretty neatly. Uh, 2010, we launched the standard off-the-shelf product, the, the, the nano product with a, uh, one, basically a one cubic, cubic millimeter size uh, uh, camera, one millimeter by one millimeter footprint, as you can see it here, and roughly one millimeter in, in uh, build height. Uh, a nice neat thing that you can do if you do wafer level uh, modules is you can cut out two or four and, 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 and you can make light field imaging or, or stereo imaging with it and you have two modules that are perfectly well aligned. That's something which is not in any sort of high volume production currently but uh, a lot of research is done what, what you could do with such small stereo cameras in an endoscopic uh, context measuring, for example, how far your scope is away from a, from a tumor or a, or a, or a lesion to, to get an absolute size measurement of it, uh, because maybe you will not cut it out the first time, but you will see if it grows or if it remains stable. But uh, if you come back uh, after a month to the next extimation and, and uh, the doctor puts the scope two millimeters more close, the tumor that actually remains stable looks much bigger and you cut it out, or, or if it's the opposite way, maybe it actually grew and, and should be removed, but uh, because the second exhumation is taken a bit farther away, it looks the same as, as the first time. So there are things that you could do in an endoscopic context with these uh, stereo modules. The standard camera modules is in disposable applications, uh, ramping up in, in quite high volumes. I think this year we will ship something close to 300,000 units. Uh, that's still a small volume in semiconductor terms, but uh, for an endoscopy type of application, it's, it's already a quite fair volume. So since I've been doing this since 2006, we thought of uh, what could we do to make it better. Uh, so some of the things when you do with endoscopy that you start to look at is, well, how does the scope look? And how does it look wh where you use it? And we appear that most of the time, we are in more or less round uh, places to look at, and most of the scopes, they are also round. And most of the lenses, or the, let's say the image circle, it's also round. So how do you put a round lens in a round scope with a square chip? It's, it's somehow uh, the quadrature of the circle. Uh, either you have uh, a chip that is smaller than, than the image that your lens forms, or you have uh, the image of the lens smaller than the chip, but in either case, either you throw away part of the image or you throw away part of the pixel area that you have. So the question uh, came up quite fast from mechanical designers. Could you make those modules round? And yes, we can. Otherwise, they would not show the slides about it. Uh, but it's not that easy because Semiconductor people, uh, and, and especially layouters and, and designers, are kind of square-minded, uh, as I am. <laughs> uh, <coughs> so all displays uh, that I know of, they start to display from the top left and, and go down. And most of the sensors, you want to address them in rows and columns. Uh, so that works pretty well if, if you put a row addressing circuit here, a column addressing circuit here. Uh, you make some contacts somewhere in the corners and there you are. Now, if you cut those corners and you cut those corners on the matrix, uh, if, you, if you make an octagonal chip, you somewhere run into a problem where you should have a row on the column decoder. Uh, and it was a little bit of a challenge. Uh, now, there was a, a gentleman called Pitago that lived a few years uh, uh, passed. Um, he found out that when you cut something at 45 degrees, actually you get more space uh, by a factor of 1.2. Uh, the amazing thing is that for the application of uh, this uh, law of Pythagore, you could actually still get the patent. 
And when you do that on the cut corners, you have actually space to place a row and column electronics uh, side by side. And you will still address rows and columns and, and get an octagonal output. Uh, but at the corners, basically, you do not have any pixels. You do not have to waste any space. And that's then basically how an octagonal chip would look like uh, as a first approximation to round images. The octagonal already saves quite some build space. Here's some uh, sample images of what we get out of, uh, of this chip. So as we have all these technologies, we can make these modules small. It means we also can make them reasonably uh, low cost. So that means we can afford to throw the camera away after a single use. I mean, you would not necessarily want to do that with your mobile phone, throw it away after the first picture you took or, or your DSLR. Uh, but it does have a number of benefits in the medical context. Uh, and I think it will, in the coming years, as it's possible, it will be a quite disruptive uh, change uh, for the medical endoscopy uh, world to, to go from the reusable sterilization uh, type of, uh, of business model to the one-time use uh, disposable models. Obviously, nothing comes for free, and, and the camera module is still kind of complicated thing and still has some cost. Uh, so you need some justification why you would throw it away after the first use. Uh, well, the easiest to justify is when you have an expensive procedure, it's done blind, uh, uh, so you stick something into the patient uh, without seeing where you go or without seeing it, with seeing it only on the, on the fluoroscopy. If the module is low cost enough, you can actually provide vision there. And if that part is expensive anyway, uh, the delta may not be so significant. Uh, then another driver is that uh, a clinical organization, especially in the developed world, um, you have planning, you, you, need, uh, you have doctors uh, that have high salaries, you have nurses that have a uh, little bit lower salaries, but still uh, quite significant. And if you have a reusable scope, uh, it's a piece of expensive equipment um, that needs to be planned for. And if you have a patient, all of a sudden you think uh, you, need a, you need a bronchoscope, but you did not foresee to have it. Maybe you don't have it and you have to run around. You, you lose time and then that patient costs in the operation center. While with the disposable, it's in the cabinet. If you decide you need one, you pull it out, uh, you use it, you throw it away afterwards. Um, then in certain cases, when you have disposable equipment, you can make a procedure outside of the operation theater. So uh, for an arthroscopy, for example, if you have a, a disposable, instead of cutting or open a knee that you have to do in the operation theater, you may be able to do it in a doctor's office, but just injecting, punctuating a needle uh, for, a, for an arthroscopy. Obviously, you save a lot of money with not bringing the patient into the operation theater. But on the long run, I think the most important uh, driver will really be patient safety. Uh, one thing which is important uh, for flexible endoscopes, they're generally not sterilized. Uh, they're just decontaminated. So already the word uh, kind of gives a shiver to me if I think that it should be used on, on myself. It's an extremely big, big driver, and that, that sounds a bit contradictory, but disposables are fastest adopted in the emerging uh, countries because people there uh, in, in, in the developing countries, they have very little confidence uh, in, in their infrastructure. And the ones that have the money to get good medical treatment there, they are extremely open to pay a premium for having disposables, uh, just because maybe the sterilization equipment, the technology, the hardware, the knowledge is not so good there. Uh, there is also a growing concern in, in the industrialized world uh, about patient cross-contamination, especially with flexible endoscopes, because they're so difficult to, so difficult to clean. Uh, and nowadays, the technology is available. There are offerings for many procedures with one-time user endoscopes. So I think pretty soon, uh, the question will be very much like uh, the injection needle. Would you really still want some glass injection syringe be used on yourself uh, as opposed to a 
one-time use plastic syringe. Some applications uh, for uh, non-classical endoscopy that you can add vision uh, to existing equipment that is already disposable. Uh, so one application is, for example, the endotracheal tube that, that you put for uh, patients in, in that intensive care units that need a uh, mechanized uh, uh, breathing. You need you, you stick this tool into the lungs and you need to somehow seal it so that the air that you pump in actually goes into the lungs and, and, and not straight away out. That obviously is much easier if you have a small camera that sees how you inflate this, uh, this balloon that seals it. Uh, another application we have come across is a, a locator coil. So that makes a little bit the link to the presentation we saw before lunch when you have radiotherapy of, of cancer in the lungs. Uh, the patient obviously has to continue breathing and, and uh, the tumor moves. Uh, so there is some uh, uh, RF uh, telemetry uh, devices available that you introduce into the region where the tumor is to, to track the tumor uh, while the patient breathes. Uh, and it's obviously much easier to find the right place if you see where you get it in as opposed to just putting it in based on CT data, you know, one centimeter in, left, next centimeter, right. Uh, it's it's uh, quite obvious that when you see where you go, you will find a better orientation. Obviously one, I think that was probably the first disposable uh, camera ever used is the pill camera. Uh, it's currently, I think, according to the data and market studies, we do still the highest um, the highest number of uh, disposable cameras used in, in medical fields, but uh, I indeed do believe that quite fast uh, other endoscopic and, and, and uh, other disposables with vision will outnumber the classical pill camera that you swallow. It takes uh, the images of uh, part of your digestive tract and then it goes out with the rest and uh, you will never ever want to recover it, obviously. <laughs> um, so here we have some images. I try to slow, try to start the movie. If I can, control click. <coughs> no. That's um. Uh, cardiac uh, um, surgery device, so, so an electrosurgical device uh, that is used to treat uh, ar arterial um, uh, fibrillation. So, so basically when you have a, a problem with the nerves in your heart valves that the uh, uh, nerve signals, they leak. Um, can we repeat it? Yeah. Uh, so, so here is, is some, some uh, electrodes and, and uh, you go into the heart here. We, we, we're just in the, in the main artery here before the, before the heart, but you would place these electrodes on, on the heart valve and then apply uh, an electric um, uh, current through, through these electrodes that, that will fix uh, the, the problem, basically the, the nerves that, uh, that should not be conducting signals to, to your heart valves and you burn it away. Again, it's quite obvious that when you see where you actually place these electrodes, it's much easier to treat that, uh, that condition than when you have just a set of electrodes and you have to look at the uh, fluoroscopy if you're really in contact with the heart valve. So whenever I show this movie, um, uh, what people ask me always is how can you see in blood? Uh, well, as you, as you observe here, we, we see a small circle. So that is a transparent hood um, within the lumens of the endoscope where you bring out the signal and, and, and the steering. You also have a flow of saline uh, water, so, so basically salt water that you pump out and it gives you a cloud of transparent water in front of the scope, which allows you, us to actually see a visible image even though we're in blood. So to conclude, before I completely overrun my time budget, um, time. <laughs> with wafer level uh, lenses and, and the miniature chip technology, uh, we have enabled chip on the tip 
uh, modules for, for the sub-3 millimeter endoscope uh, uh, category. And uh, they are at the price point where you get viable, disposable, one-time use uh, equipment. Uh, disposables, I think, will be the next big uh, game changer in the endoscopy, probably after introducing actually solid state images to the endoscopy world, uh, mainly for patient safety. And uh, also the disposables allow to add direct visualization to tools that previously were, were blind and, and uh, it helps to make this uh, treatment faster and with better patient outcome. Yeah, thank you for your attention and please do visit our websites. They're still not 100% integrated. Uh, uh, so some of the stuff you will still find our, on our old CMOSIS page. Thank you very much. Thank you.